Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? Today we have two films and no souls. My right. name is Eric. I have no soul. And I'm here with Michael. And I presume that you do not have a soul I don't as have well. A soul. Two hosts with no souls doing films about the soul, kind of. Uh, one film very about the soul yeah. and one film not so much. Although I'm going to say that uh, today's feature is dubious companies offering science fiction services within the films of, uh, I don't know, unlikely genres. Wow, yeah, that's good. Also, we could cover indie films that we don't have any bearing <laughs> right. on. Right, that's stuff that no one wants to hear us talk yeah, about. And yeah, stuff that the... we're a little uncomfortable talking about. So what are the movies that we're talking we're about here? Cold Souls and Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Um, Eternal Sunshine, anyways, is something that we've referenced a lot. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, for whatever reason, it always, I don't know why it comes up so frequently. There's a bunch of memorable scenes. I guess yeah. that's what it is. Yeah. And something it seems like we should cover. And Cold Souls is just too fucking fitting not to put on yeah, the show. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you're going to do Eternal Sunshine, right. that's what you do it with. But for people who are maybe listening to the show for the first time, because we never really think about this when we start recording, but every single show we do is a new show for somebody. I mean, somebody's going to find the show and never have heard double feature before eventually we're gonna do a film i really like and then i'm gonna listen uh but while it's just me and rob zombie listening to the show and whoever newly came over and started listening to this one this is very unlike the movies we usually cover yeah. i like to think we cover a diverse range of movies we basically just cover movies that are slasher films disguised as other films yeah pretty um, much <laughs> uh i like how that we're not even disguising we just that we just point. cover films with balls that's, yeah, that's it's films with balls. That could be the tagline for double feature uh, films with balls. Two films for I guess that would be four balls. Is that what that is? Two films, four balls, two right. hosts, one there, show. There's already too many balls on this show. But yeah, so these kind of fall into the I don't like using indie genre. Here's why. And we don't have a better term. So we're just going to continue to use indie genre. But indie to me says on the film side, it says independent. Right. And on the music side, it says shitty music that I don't care about. Well, the, I mean, we can get into this on both the film and music scale. Indie okay. was this thing that, that it meant independent. Right. But then for some reason, everything independent was starting to define itself as something boring and pretentious. Right. And I mean, that started in film too. Yeah. Any, everything was drawn with pencils and you're <laughs> supposed to think that that was artistic because right. they were doing it for little money. But then big budget films started doing it yep. just to kind of, I guess, get on the indie bandwagon. Yeah, right. It's about picking up culture from, uh, there's actually, there's a whole documentary kind of about this called The Merchants of Cool, which may be something we, I don't know why we never did that on the show, come to think of it. But uh, the documentary is about how different firms, um, I think it's called trend scouting, where they uh, basically pick up culture from teenagers and then recycle it and sell it back to them. And that's kind of what happened in film. Mm -hmm. um, you know, MTV Studios is a perfect example of one of the studios that I think that was the one that was behind Napoleon Dynamite, yeah. which for me was the end of when I could care yeah, about it. For me, it was film. either Napoleon Dynamite or Garden State. Garden State was, yeah, that was another one where they kind of looked at what was happening with independent film and they said, let's mimic that. And there's something a little disingenuous about that. Nothing disingenuous about these two movies. No, not though. at all. But just to kind of talk, that's the most we'll ever talk yeah. about the so-called indie right. genre. Right. Well, there. I think that's why I think that's why we we're doing these films is because they they stand out as more than just you know bullshit indie flicks. Yeah, yeah, for sure, absolutely. So if this isn't already going to be a rocky show, we're still kind of getting used to this new studio space here. Uh, this morning, I got here before you did, mm -hmm. obviously. Uh, I locked myself out of the studio oh, this morning. Good. I was cleaning up in here. I decided to take the trash out the back. And there's, so this tells you the quality of the place where there's one of those locks with the little chain that oh, goes on top good. of it. And uh, I left that on the front door. Back door had no lock so to get back to in. Out how to jimmy it from the so front door. So I, I go to walk in the front door where I still had keys and I could not get in. But we're inside now and it's a big mystery. Right. How we, I had to fucking Houdini my way back in right. here. So it turns out there's spoilers. God, this is the longest fucking introduction. It's all right. I should have told people they could skip through this. 
we no longer have to worry about the new people coming to the show because by now they've decided the show is not worth listening to. So we have chapters in the show. You know what? Use them right now to skip to the first film. Which will be Cold Souls. Yeah. Cold Souls we're going to do first. Uh, if you haven't seen that, we are going to spoil the films as well. And these films are crazy, but still spoilable. spoilable. Yeah, you know what? If you've only seen the films once, they may still be spoilable. Yep, it would have so, been for me. Yeah, so maybe you should watch uh, the movies a couple times. Or once and then, immediately, and then listen to the show. Yeah, you know what? Choose your own, once again, on Double Feature, choose, choose your, your own, own adventure. adventure. <laughs> so there's spoilers. Use the chapters you can skip right now to Eternal Sunshine or to the end of the show. And so we start with Cold Souls. All right. So Cold Souls is a it's a Sophie Barth's film. Sophie who? What? I I think she's French, right? Yeah. She's a French director. We rarely do female directors on the show. It's not because we don't like them. Mm -hmm. it's because they don't direct films with balls. Is that it? No, that's not why. It's because we can't it's just find that we enough can't of them. Find them. Yeah. Exactly. There's not enough. You know what? Maybe I should take that back. I'm not positive she's French. Uh, I I tried really hard. That's why I got here early today to try and look up stuff about her but this is her first yeah, major film exactly so not all she doesn't even have a goddamn wikipedia page so i'm not even sure we're pronouncing her name right that's how fresh that you want to talk about indie director fresh indie street cred right here this you have it first film by this woman so cold souls is this film it came out in 2009 it came out fairly recently and it stars Paul Giamatti as, uh, what's his character's name? Paul Giamatti. Oh, that's right. You want to... All right, so I'm getting JCVD flashbacks yeah. already. You know this scares me when this happens. But because you told me about the nature of the film, I'm okay with it. I guess I'm okay with films that star the main actor as themselves when they're doing something in such a crazy situation that it's... Uh, I mean, we're talking about his soul here, uh -huh. right? So we're not... With the JCVD thing, I was worried that... He's trying to tell us what he's really like, but mm -hmm. the great Pendulette quote uh, that I don't remember, so I'm just going to tell you what it was about. Uh, talking uh, in what was the movie we saw? Uh, Michael Moore Hates America. Right. Which is less about Michael Moore. It focused instead a lot on filmmaking, on documentary right, making. Right. And in that movie, Mr. Gillette was talking about how once the cameras are rolling, you're not seeing real life anymore. Once there are cameras there, that's it. That's, you know, to even a, a more heightened sense when you do something like jcvd a film starring jcvd as himself he is going to be acting the way that he wants people to think he is and it, does that make sense yeah totally <laughs> okay so when i see paul giamatti starring as himself i'm already scared that it's going to be the way paul giamatti wants people to think about who he really is but it's more of uh paul giamatti chasing down his soul yeah so it's it's such an insane situation that that tops any Look at me, I'm a big movie star. You know, that's not what this is about at all. It's just kind of a it's kind of a, a fortunate thing that they get Paul Giamatti to play the role because mm -hmm. essentially the role calls for a an actor that people are familiar with but isn't famous. Right. So they would either, Al Pacino. They would either have to fake it, get an actor to play an actor, right. or they just nail down somebody that we already can identify with and you cut out 20 minutes of the film identifying this person as a semi-famous actor. Which you just don't have time exactly. for in a movie like this. And it does add some kind of kitsch value to it. I mean, Paul Giamatti playing himself. But the original Paul Giamatti in this case is Woody Allen. Sophie approached Paul Giamatti and told him about this dream she had in which Woody Allen was, was there in the dream and it was kind of about souls and you see the end product on screen here. But apparently, I guess they were at a festival or something. I don't have all the details in front of me. But apparently, upon telling Paul Giamatti that she wanted to do a film about this and have Paul play himself, uh, Paul is ready to sign up on the spot Great. right there. So he is obviously behind this. And Great. that's what you It shows. Need. Yeah, because you can also get the opposite end of that. And I think you, you see that a lot with uh, movies about you know this kind of stardom. It, and we talked about it with JCVD. Once again, not to keep going back to that. But he was, you know, down on his luck. He's trying to find a good role. You see all that stuff with him mm -hmm. talking to his agent. And it just kept going through my mind. Oh, I know what would really help his film career. A movie about himself exactly. as a person. And that's not this at all. It also this didn't is, work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, he got on our show, which is all an actor can hope to do that's in their really, failing career, I guess. Absolutely true. So yeah. good job, Paul Giamatti. We haven't seen you well, in Well, not while. Paul Giamatti. I, I met JCVD, but go ahead. Um, so Cold Souls is... Um, a disguised science fiction film. Mm -hmm. It comes in bearing sci-fi teeth. Yeah. You walk in. The The film starts with this really odd, heavy portrayal of Uncle Vanya. Uh, can, can I pause you there? Yeah. Actually, the film starts with a Rene Descartes quote. 
which says something about how the soul is located in the middle of your brain. That's a really beautiful philosophy. Yeah, I know. Well, Descartes obviously being a philosopher, this the, the quote I just love because it's not so much philosophy as just really terrible yeah. biology. It's, a, it's, it's just a, awful biology. It's an untested hypothesis. <laughs> yeah. That's all it is. Yeah, okay. Your all brain's right. in your elbow. Don't test that. <laughs> all right, That's go philosophy. on. Sorry, go ahead. So it starts with this heavy-handed portrayal of Uncle Vanya, which is yeah. a Russian play. It's very famous. I mean, there's portrayals of Uncle Vanya probably monthly in Chicago. Wow, I did not know that. Um, How do you know more about the Chicago theater scene than me? What? That's a three weird. Three of my friends are actors. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Sorry, go ahead. So, yeah, Uncle Vanya is a play, and it's very Russian, as they state in the film. <laughs> very Russian, it's about, sure. It's about a sad state of affairs, and it's about this family, and it's about this particular uncle who eventually breaks down. Mm -hmm. And Paul Giamatti's playing that role. It seems like ever since Christmas on Mars, Russian films have been trying to sneak their right. way into double feature somehow. Maybe eventually. Yeah. Once we have four hours. <laughs> yeah, right. So Paul Giamatti's portrayal is heavy and it's it's trying on him as a human being. In the play, you mean. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I mean. Sorry. And so he goes home that night absolutely drained. He feels like he's too connected to the character. Right. He gets a call from his agent. And he flips open the New Yorker. Mm -hmm. And in there it says soul storage. Well, for that's clearly what you need in this case, right? right? You need your soul separated from your body. Um, and it's and all the advertisement that he finds, he looks it up in the yellow or the white pages, yellow yeah. pages. And there's like this big ad, soul getting you down, yeah, remove right. it. And all of it is absolute bullshit midday TV commercials. Yeah, yeah. It's x-ray vision in the yeah, back of your comic exactly. book. That's what it is. And and so he's hesitant, but eventually he goes. And it's it doesn't get any more scientific than too much soul, let's get it to go. <laughs> yep. And he walks in. The and ad really gives you the most information really, you ever find out about that. So he walks in, and I would imagine that one of, I don't want to say the president of the company, mm -hmm. but one of the higher-ups of the company is played by David Stratton, who we saw in... Good night and good luck. Thank you. Fantastic in this movie. He's great. He's and he's, such a departure from that role to be that that's the only other yeah. thing we've seen him in uh, on the show. Here he's almost got the mad scientist yeah. hair going. He's something between a, a bad doctor, uh, all, uh, Arrested Development, right? And then you know, Back to the Future's Doc Brown, mad scientist. Maybe even Tesla. Yeah, there's a little Tesla there. Yeah. But he also has this horrible spokesperson vibe. Yes, that too. It seems like he's totally behind the product, but he doesn't really care if you're into it. Nope. And Paul Giamatti sits down, nervous as hell, that he's about to get his soul removed. And the audience is begging one question. How does it work? <laughs> yeah. What does the soul do? How is the soul apply to the body? And David Strathairn goes, we don't know how the soul works. <laughs> we can just take it out. <laughs> right. We can And show it to you. We can... We can disembody the soul right. or desoul the body, right. however you want to look at it. And then he throws in these glasses, says, you can look inside if you want. And, and this whole scene is riddled with some of the best dark humor that you yeah. see in the entire movie. Yeah. Paul Giamatti's terrified to let his soul be stored in New Jersey. <laughs> right. He's upset. He, he, there's a scene where he spills his soul onto the floor. Right, this right. absolute slapstick, yeah, slapstick moment. Scene, yeah. And there's a great moment. I think one of my favorite moments in the entire film is when they put him in that capsule. Right. And he's supposed to push blue if he doesn't feel anything and red if he does. When he gets the rabbit. He he he's holding the, the rabbit. rabbit. He's staring oh, God, at it. It's so funny. No facial expression. Yeah. And then just a blue light goes on. Yeah, right. And that's that to boot. They ask how he feels. You're like, um, kind of bored. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, great. Almost that's like how that's everybody a question, feels. Right. Yeah. What I like about the treatment of all of this whole stuff is that you're concerned with the mundane stuff. You're not, right. you don't worry about the existentialism. What does the soul mean? How do we know there's a soul? You, you know, a little chickpea spits out yeah. into a canister. They're talking about, do you pay that with on credit or yeah. do you, you know, the New Jersey thing is to avoid sales yeah. tax. I mean, it's so trivial. The kind of stuff the company is actually the whole character of Lauren, uh, Lauren Ambrose's character, the sort of secretary who, by the way, uh, severely underused yeah. in here. Lauren Ambrose has maybe three speaking lines. I love her. I wish she showed up in more stuff. She was uh, six feet under. Right. Um, she wasn't six <laughs> feet under. That sounds terrible. She was in the show Six Feet Under, where she was a fucking rock star of a uh, cast member on that show. I mean, one of the main characters, mm -hmm. it was a huge show. And kind of disappeared into obscurity after that, which is tragic to me. But her whole character, she's just this, this kind of 
secretary that is concerned with these tiny mundane right. details it's what the whole company is about well there's there's the one scene that embodies that whole moment where they're looking at the souls on the shelf mm-hmm. and he goes uh this one's a celebrity yeah paul giamatti goes who and he goes i can't tell you that but i believe they had a melanoma right and as if that that's also that's equally as interesting yes which sure. celebrity i don't know but they did have a melanoma <laughs> yeah okay and that's how that's kind of a blueprint for the entire treatment of the company. Yeah, right. You never get the juicy information. You just get the boring side and for how much does it cost? How do right. you pay? So much so that we need the story of the black market in order to make we have a company that extracts your soul and we have to throw in a what should be a B story mm-hmm. when you when you think about if you were to treat this realistically, which you fucking can't because there's no soul. No such thing as a soul, people. But were there a soul and we found that out and there was a company that extracted it, mm-hmm. uh, that should be a story in itself. But because the dark comedy lies in how mundane it is, we have to have the black market to spice right. things up. Well, that kind of gets introduced when Paul Giamatti rents a new soul. He's not good at playing Uncle Vanya soulless, so he decides to rent a Russian poet soul. <laughs> yeah. And that kind of leads that him That works on. for him. It works. It yeah. makes him portray the role am- amazingly. The director's crying. It's yeah. just a wonderful performance. Good for him. But what he ends up wanting to do is, first off, that soul is too intense for him. Yeah. He wants to meet the donor, and he wants his soul back. These three things can only be accomplished by using an entire Russian story around yeah, it. Yeah, right. Where there's, there's... Which kind of parallels the play a little bit. Right. It's the same kind of commentary. There's Russian mules, which are just attractive Russian women... Right. ...who are taking souls from St. Petersburg to America or from America back to St. Petersburg. One of the mules, Nina, ends up kind of falling in love with Paul Giamatti's soul. She rents one of his films. That was one of my favorite Paul <laughs> yeah. Giamatti films. Yeah. I believe it's called Let's Go Somewhere and Make Love. <laughs> yeah, we should really have paired that film on the show. Um... It's totally made up. That's not a real I film. hope it's not made up. Um, but... So she ends up helping him out because she knows his soul gets stolen. She steals yeah. it. She borrows it. <laughs> borrows. But she steals his soul because the leader of the Russian black market, this is where the plot actually kind of begins. The A story. Everything else is kind of a Steven Spielberg, welcome to the <laughs> universe. Okay. And then we get an A story where Paul Giamatti's soul is stolen, taken to St. Petersburg, and given to this soap opera actress who is the wife of the Russian black market, the Russian yeah. soul black market. Yes. And so she wants the soul of a great American actor. She sends them a list. It's got, what, Johnny Depp, Al Pacino's on there, Robert yeah. De Niro, all these actors that we don't do the movies of. <laughs> yeah, And instead she gets Paul Giamatti and they just lie. I'm fine with having Paul Giamatti's soul. I would want Paul Giamatti's soul over uh, Al Pacino's soul. I need Al Pacino's soul is probably dark and twisted. Yeah. I'm not sure that I would want that. I believe it had a melanoma. But also the thing about Paul Giamatti's soul is apparently he's not famous in Russia. No. Apparently the Russians don't know who he is, especially the soap opera actress. That's a shame. So... Maybe soap operas are just big over there. They're all really excited that she has a soap opera role. So Paul and Nina kind of team up. Paul wants his soul back. Nina feels bad. And she also has this connection to him because she's got some residual Giamatti soul in her. Oh, yeah, the soul left behind. The 5% of soul left behind. From all this traveling back and forth. and, And she gains so much from everybody. But she has this connection. She really liked Paul's soul. Man, and I promised you back when we did Faster Pussycat and Mean Girls that there would be more sincerity on year three of Double Feature. That scene... That his encounter with Nina, that is the most sincerity and probably the wrongest of place. I mean, the perfect place for the dark humor stuff. But it's that first encounter he has with Nina. And I think they're in a hotel room. Yeah. And she is throwing him punchlines. And with every single punchline, he tears up a little bit more. I mean, by, by the time he's done, he really, Paul Giamatti looks so torn up inside, so fucking sad. He is taking this absolutely seriously. And she is just, she's making jokes. Right. I mean, not her character, but right. in you know that's that's what the film is feeding you. It's feeding you punchlines where you're supposed to laugh at the absurdity of the situation, but they're taking it dead seriously, which you know I love. So what ends up happening is they get the soul back. That's no, that's no. I mean, everybody knows that's going to happen. That's kind of what the film has lined up. The interesting part of the film, and and the thing that you kind of kept questioning, and I I honestly don't have. A complete answer to. All right. You kept asking why Russia. Yeah. And 
The honest answer is I don't know. Maybe they have a powerful black market. Maybe there's some Russian soul thing in art. Right. I don't know Russian art as well as I wish I did. Yeah. But what I can say is that the film at least hands you one bit of information that you can apply to everything. Mm -hmm. And that's when Paul Giamatti tells the doctor, David Strathairn's character, that he's playing Uncle Vanya. And mm -hmm. David Strathairn goes, oh, it's so Russian. <laughs> right. All the characters are so unlikable. Yeah. And it's so dark and everybody's brooding. Says that early in the film almost lets you know what's coming. Exactly. It's almost a satire of that. So once everybody's in Russia, you kind of realize all the characters are really unlikable. Yeah. And nobody's happy. Nope. And Paul Giamatti finally looks into his soul. Something he's neglected to do the entire film out of fear. I believe it's out of, we don't want to make the audience question the mechanics of the soul Exactly, too much. that's fine If Paul too. Giamatti is repulsed by knowing about the soul, we as an audience don't ask those questions. Right. So he finally has to confront his soul. And it's this weird, everything is really earth-toned. Everybody's bald. Things are in slow motion. He's constantly moving toward light. But never finds it. Right. People have babies. Babies are running around. Well, the whole scene opens with both. We've talked about infinite white space yes. before. When we did Bronson on mm -hmm. the JCVD, who know we would be making these parallels. But when we did Bronson, we talked about infinite black space, which is used very often in reference to theater. You know, when we see Paul Giamatti on the stage, it often looks like it's just infinite black behind him. This is the first time I have ever seen infinite white space and infinite black space in the same setting. Yeah. And it's when he looks into his soul. So his soul is, it's not twisted. It's not gross, but it's really heavy. It's very, it seems depressing, but you can't, I can't really understand why it, I mean, the, it's just shot and done and treated in a very depressing manner and very heavy, but it seems artistic. Mm -hmm. And Nina says that she loves his soul and that his soul's beautiful, but then again, Paul can't handle this Russian poet's soul. Yeah. So I would venture to say that Paul Giamatti in the film has what would be considered a Russian soul, and that's why Nina's really into it, because she's, you know, she's, she's Russian. Right. She gets it, and maybe he doesn't get it, and that's why he can't play Uncle Vanya, because he's too connected. Right. He's got a Russian soul. And I'm not saying, you know, in an existential way, Paul Giamatti in another life was Russian or any bullshit yeah, like that. Yeah. All I'm this saying is reincarnation. All I'm saying is artistically, if you had to identify his soul along the artistic tenets of any national culture, it would be most closely relative to Russian. Yeah, it's looking at maybe not his film career, but perhaps his methodology or his uh, kind of his style. Right. I mean, I've seen him do so many different things that I wouldn't even say he has a particular style, but... Uh, it could be a commentary on his career and his style being, like you say, more in line with some of the right. uh, themes uh, that you see in a lot sure. of this Russian stuff. It could just be a tie-in between the Russian play and all mm -hmm. of the Russians who are also yeah. stealing the souls. Um, it could be a way to bring the black market in. I mean, I think at the very least it accomplishes two or three things, whether it's set out to accomplish yeah. those or not. Uh, it could be completely by accident, but it, it helps bring all of that stuff together really well. Sure. I'm not looking at symbolism here. I'm just kind of, I think that honestly, they're going Russian. That's the one. That's the, that's the culture we're going with. Everything will be Russian. We'll okay. pick a Russian play. We'll give them a yep. Russian soul. We'll use Russian people. We'll use the Russian black market. I mean, they, they may have me. reasons behind it, but great. I think the Russian thing was great. I loved it. Honestly, you want to know a secret? Hmm. When I watched this film the first time, I didn't know it had subtitles. So a lot of the Russian stuff just didn't, I didn't understand it. Oh my God. Well, and before we get lost too much in the specific things that the movie is saying, I really like it from uh, maybe not an abstract point of view, but uh, just a broad one to step back and look at this commentary on the soul. Mm -hmm. Some of the funniest stuff to me Absolutely. is just that people really believe in real yeah. life that there is a soul and the movie is showing you how absurd a lot of that is. Sure. Our souls are going to be stored together. <laughs> yeah, right. That, and right. then there's the one line, um, this is the scientist's soul. He didn't think he had one. Right. Can you imagine being that scientist and going, oh, you're going to remove my soul? Oh, really? 20,000 ruples. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And it's a chickpea when it comes yeah. out. Or a jelly bean. It was a jelly bean or a piece of charcoal. They're all food. Right. For some reason, it's all food. And you want to talk about the movie's intent. I don't think this is the movie's intent at all. But when you're talking about something like, do we have souls? I think the quickest way to see how absurd and silly that is, is just to go, well, what would it be like if we had souls? Let's say we could extract them and store them in New Jersey. Is that something that realistically people might actually have living inside of them? Great. 
while we're just dispelling myths left and right, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, I believe, is a movie about the Montauk monster, yeah, which is right. an animal corpse that washed up on uh, on the shore, and people thought that it was a monster, but it turns out it it's was a bloated a, raccoon, a decaying raccoon. That's not actually what the movie's about at all. No. I just haven't got to You can use see it a, on the uh, beach, though, when they meet. Go back and watch I, no, the movie. No, you can't. Go this... back and watch the movie and see if you can find the Montauk monster on Oh, the you beach. have to pause the scene and it falls from it the falls sky in... at the end. <laughs> yeah. That's not a spoiler because no one knows what, what <laughs> I'm movie I'm so referencing. I'm so glad you picked up on that. Oh, man. <laughs> I just wanted an opportunity to use another... That is total bullshit. Sometimes we do entire episodes about characters. And I think if we did that here, we would probably annoy ourselves to death. Yeah. So I want to talk instead about the filmmaker, because Michelle Gondry's come up on the show one billion times, and we've never actually talked about Michelle Gondry and what he's... We've mentioned what he's done. Yeah. Uh, really quick, you know, Be Kind Rewind, yeah. we talked about. Science the of Science Sleep. of Sleep, we talked about. I think his best stuff is in Eternal Sunshine. Yeah. And I really want to focus on some of the special effects stuff. And the nonlinear storytelling. I mean, you take your pick. We got two big things to talk about. Which do you want to go into first? Why don't we just go into the uh, nonlinear storytelling first? You know, even after the summer of indie films wore off on me, and I kind of became disillusioned with a lot of that stuff, the nonlinear elements of Eternal Sunshine, which were a lot newer and more fresh at the point it came out, in that Pulp Fiction era of, that post-Pulp Fiction era, I guess, of mixing up your story for yeah. little to no reason, um, I'm just going to throw the movie out there now, Memento, because I know I'm going to have to make some kind of connection to that at some point. But Memento was something we covered early on the show. You should probably not even listen to that episode. Um, but way back in year one, that mixed up the story because the character had, uh, it was kind of mixed up in his head. I won't tell anybody anything about Memento because they can just go see that. But that was the excuse they had for doing that. We've gotten to a point with today's films where they often just cut themselves up and rearrange the order because they're not doing anything else interesting. Uh -huh. With Eternal Sunshine, they're using a nonlinear narrative. It doesn't even so much have a pattern. There's just interjections of scenes that came before the chronology of the movie really starts, you know, with scene one. And there's stuff that comes, you know, toward the end. And that's one of the reasons that you, I think you need to see it a couple times yeah. is because when you watch it through the first time, it's still got a lot of mystery to it. I mean, that's, you know, as much as I kind of go, well, movies that have nothing to offer and cut up their story, that's lame. I love that mystery element of trying yeah. to figure out what's going on. Yeah. And you can do that with literally any movie, no matter how boring or shitty it is. As long as you have hair you, color clues. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. That's the, the clue they give you here. And I, you know what? That's, it's gimmicky, but I feel like it's, you need something. You need it. To, no, I, it's. Because yeah, otherwise you is, have no the, idea. The what, thing that I think Eternal Sunshine does so well is it tends to do the things that in any other scenario, in a film like Juno, mm -hmm. in a film like Garden State, I would roll my eyes at. I would uh -huh. gag over. Something like hair color defines where we are chronologically. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. But <laughs> right. it works perfectly. It's yeah. exact. You need that. Yeah. You can't do it without it. And it's, I'm, I'm just, I'm floored by the fact that I'm actually agreeing with a filmmaker in, yeah, no, you do need to change the color of her hair. Otherwise, no one's going to know what's going on. Well, it's that and it's the pen mark on the side right. of Joel's head, I think, because we... Well, every character kind of needs a sign, or yeah. at least the main, the two main characters, you need to know where they are chronologically. Right. Because they're the characters that are there in all three stages. Well, especially with Joel, because a lot of what we're following is his story. You know, the stuff with Patrick and with Clementine, that's the only let's say, modern day chronology. A lot of what's going on has either previously happened, or I think more commonly is in Joel's head. Uh -huh. So we need to know where Joel's at. We need to have the ridiculous pajamas that he bought and the marker on the side of his head, or we have no idea how to line things up. So if you, I, you know, I feel really stupid explaining this because a lot of people have seen this movie a hundred times and now it's so obvious. But if you just saw the movie for the first time. Or second time. This is my second time seeing the Yeah, film. I do think you kind of need some of that stuff pointed out to you. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. If you don't, the film won't do it for you. You know what else the special effects hair dye is really great for is offsetting your gloom and doom lame gothiness. Yeah. This is... So they make fun of the hair colors. I think my hair color was atomic pink, uh -huh. although I like the phrasing of cotton candy pink better, but I'm pretty sure I ended up using atomic because it was brighter. Anyways, once upon a time, too much black gothiness going on. So I dyed different spots of my hair, bright, obnoxious pink. And in doing this, I met these people like Clementine, who had noticed that I had pink hair. 
and who also dyed their hair crazy colors. And Clementine is a perfect portrayal of one of these crazy teenage kids who the the stupid quote she uses, right? Apply or the the thing from the tape, I think it is. Right. Uh, applying her personality in a paste. But yeah, I glossed over the the characters for being kind of obnoxious, but I think they're pretty accurate too. I know a lot of people who are like that. I don't think these are completely fictitious characters just made up to be obnoxious. I think a lot of people who saw this movie when it came out, I knew people who saw this movie and identified with characters sure. like that. I think there's a time in everybody's life where they can identify sure. with some of that yeah. stuff. Yeah, I think that that's, that's the one thing about the characters that I don't like. It's not the characters themselves, it's that the characters are to be taken seriously. I think the thing I don't like is that I used to identify with some of those right. characters. Well, the and other, I now look like Mark Ruffalo, apparently. The thing, that, the thing that's kind of impressive about the film is that even though I'm kind of annoyed by every character, mm-hmm. and I don't identify with them, I acknowledge that those obnoxious characters are <laughs> completely necessary yes. for this film to go. Right. This film couldn't work. If the characters were all people that I would consider normal, if if this film were more full of Cold Souls characters, yeah. this film couldn't be a Michelle Gondry film. Michelle yeah. Gondry kind of Michelle Gondry kind of represents a certain subculture that I'm not a part of. It's unapologetic creative music videos. Exactly, that's what Michelle Gondry sure. does. And there's a place for that. Yeah, and if you for can sure. find the story that fits in your universe, absolutely, that's fantastic. You do have other characters of that story I really like. I'm not going to do the thing I joked about on the last show about how this is Jim Carrey's serious performance. That's such a joke to me because he's done three or four of those movies. Yeah. Where everyone says this. I mean, there was Man on the Moon. And then The Majestic. The Majestic. There was this one. And then there was the number 23, that, I which mean, came later. That which, was a comedy, but he didn't know it. <laughs> right. Nobody knew it. Right. And then he went back to doing, what is it? Yes, Man? Mis- yeah. Mr. The Man yes. Who Says Yes. So I'm not going to say a lot about Jim Carrey's performance, but I do think... That opening scene of all the emotional moments the film tries to have that I just dismiss as whimsy and kind of that music video stuff where I say, oh, this is like a Bjork video. That's yeah. fun. Uh, Bjork the, or White Stripes. Yeah. Those are the two big ones. Yeah. Um, the one that really does work for me every time is when Joel is sitting in that car. They're listening to the Beck song. The um, Everybody's, Everybody's Gotta, gotta learn, learn Sometime. Sometime. Yeah. And the sad part, not the, uh-huh. not the kind of melancholy, right. happy, bittersweet part. But uh, the really fucking sad part, and he's just losing it and crying and driving down the road. And it's pretty short. I always remember it being, you know, the entire song, but it's not. It's that little short bit. And that part's awesome. The other one that I really like is David Cross. Yeah. Um, That's probably why this comes up all the time is because I like talking about David Cross. But he just plays. He's building a birdhouse. He, he flies an airplane. He's the I mean, one. He's the one that kind of gets the ball rolling. He's yeah. the one that breaks the rules and yeah. goes, "Yo, we got this card." Yeah, right. And then that's immediately one upped in the film zone way by erasing Clementine's name. Well, because as much of a goofy character as he is, this kind of stoner, almost loser character. Yeah. you know, he's with his wife and appears to have, or his girlfriend or whatever, living with her, and has this. That's the other representation of relationships in in this movie. All you have is the weird thing going on with Patrick which I'm not even going to, that's a, you know, that's a different plot. That's not a relationship I'm looking at there. That's just manipulation. But you have this thing with Joel and Clementine, and you have this other relationship you don't see a lot of Joel's friends. Yes, yeah. and everybody's miserable. Yeah, and of course they're fucking miserable. But David Cross's character, I think, respects Joel and is one of the only people throughout this entire thing who really respects him enough to say, here's this card. Here, you know, you're an adult. You can handle this stuff. But to talk about pot smoking characters, then we have all of the the kids who are running the operation. Right. I really love that it's all of these like underage. Yeah, well, kids. it's it's what Elijah Wood yeah. plays Patrick, uh-huh. and then Mark Ruffalo and Kirsten Dunst are the yeah. other two. Yeah, and Mark Ruffalo, he's a character actor. He shows up a lot in. I mean, he's been in a lot of films. Yeah, yeah. This guy shows up all over the place, and he's a fine actor. Yeah. And then Kirsten Dunst is also in the film. We did, we did uh, interview, interview. The That's all that needs to be said. We did Small Soldiers. Yeah. She doesn't, I mean, she's static. She's yeah. static as an actor, not as a character. Elijah Wood's hip and disappeared Great. for a while. Where did he go? In the few times we have ever talked about drug use on the show, if you want to know why neither of us do pot, me specifically, I will tell you the reason I don't do pot, but I think maybe you'll, uh, you'll see where I'm coming from on this. That scene where they're laying on the bed and he's talking about how the clash is the, the only band that ever mattered, the greatest band that ever existed. And she's talking, she ends up talking about the quote book and all this and stuff. And the innocence of babies. Yeah. And there, well, that's the, that scene specifically where they're lying on the bed, uh, the innocence of babies clash scene. 
that's it. That's right there. That is the one scene. If anyone ever asks you, hey, do you know why Eric Ingram doesn't do pot? Show them the two minute scene of that shit right there. Yeah. I don't ever want to waste my time talking to or participating in a fucking conversation like that. Yeah, I'm with you, man. So to get back to the nonlinear narratives, which we in in talking about nonlinear narratives, we've completely branched out from nonlinear narratives. And now we're going to come right back to them. Michelle Gondry would love this show. A reason beyond the element of mystery, why you're cutting this this movie up, is because you're talking about a relationship that decayed, but you almost want an optimistic look at it. Um, you want to take a look that people often don't at why these relationships started in the first place. What was mm-hmm. good about I find this to be extremely relatable. I don't know if that's just my history and the 30 different fucking people failed relationships that yeah. I've had, but oftentimes you start with these great relationships and they slowly crumble over time, and by the end, you fucking despise each other. And you forget why you were ever with this person in the first place. And by mixing this up, especially in Joel's memory, where he's going essentially backwards through it, you know, as the uh, movie goes on, we start with the stuff where they hate each other, we slowly start to see... I mean, by the, the first time we see Clementine actually be civil to him... It's almost like, who is this other person? Mm -hmm. And then you see them come to the disagreement. You see them talk about babies and how that kind of starts an argument. And then before that, you know, you see later in the relationship where they're arguing um, less and less. But you still see little hints of how that kind of the downward spiral, but going in the opposite direction. You know what I mean? Sure. Uh, I just think that's a really great way to look at that relationship. And that kind of provides a good ending for the movie when they start to get back together which is sort of the bookends from yeah. the, the well, beginning of the movie. It too. kind of, yeah. The, the, the interesting part of the film is that it's kind of a, it's kind of like a cosine wave mm-hmm. where you start at zero. And then as the film kind of backtracks, mm-hmm. you see this relationship rebuild itself yeah. and you get back up to the top where everything is great. And you totally understand why they got back together and then they get back together and you know, it's just going to go back down. <laughs> yeah, right, right. It's going to go back downhill and, I mean, if you're going to tell a relationship story and you don't want it to have just a... If you're going to tell a true relationship story, not mm-hmm. a bullshit Meg Ryan relationship yeah. story... Well, not the relationship story you see in every stupid, romantic, nonsense exactly. film. And you don't want to end it in a miserable, all relationships right. end in yes. disaster. The yeah. best way to do that is tell it backwards, start it over, but don't show the end again. Yeah, beautiful. It's beautiful. I mean, it's the best execution of something like this. But it's not, uh, you know, they're not lying to the audience about it. It's not this happy ignorance thing. You know, that's why I love that little exchange of dialogue at the very end when they get their tapes back. Um, We could have done the whole show just talking about the legality of getting the tapes back, which seems like something we would usually talk about. But after that scene, they're listening to their tapes. You know, they're in Joel's apartment at that point and they're arguing and she says to him, you know, you're just going to hate me and I'm just going to, what she say? I'm going to end up being bored and feel Cause that's, trapped. Because that's, that's what I do. Yeah. I get fucking bored and trapped. I know exactly sure. what she's talking about there. And he says to her, okay, that's fine. Yeah. And if you're going to find a message in this film, if I want to find a message in this film, that's the fucking one I want to yeah. find. He acknowledges that not all of his relationships are going to work. This one might be doomed to failure, but this isn't about the end outcome. It's about the day by day and enjoying the experience that he has as, you know, he has those experiences. Mm -hmm. The ones that he just went through in his mind as it was wiped, there was good stuff in there. And if he can get good experiences out of life, that's worth it, even if he doesn't end up growing old and dying with the person. Well, exactly. He sees going backwards. He can finally accept without being bitter and callous. Yeah, right. What everybody eventually accepts maybe five months (laughs) after dumping somebody or being dumped. Maybe that wasn't so bad. Yeah. You know, you, you start you start forgetting all the bad stuff and you realize, you know, even though it ends in a supernova of a romantic catastrophe, mm-hmm. it's worth it. Yeah. You know, there was an alternate ending to this um, that I'm pretty sure they never filmed. You know what? They might have filmed it, actually. I don't remember if I've seen the alternate ending or just heard about it, but I think it would have worked for the film just as well, although apparently they thought it was too much of a downer. But over the credits, they were just going to replay them falling in love, having conflicts, and then erasing their memories and doing that over and over until they die. And that polarizes a lot of people. I've heard a lot of people talk about how that makes the movie completely different. But I think that's the exact same movie. 
I think that's the fucking message of the film. That's Absolutely. what we just talked yeah. about. It's enjoying the experiences you have in your life rather than trying to build to something grand, which you may never achieve all the while passing up these experiences. Exactly. For that, sure. You know, that stupid fucking cliche quotes, that indie hipster quote about how life is what happens while you're making plans. Yeah. That's what the movie's saying. And something about babies and childhood, apparently, is also what the movie is Yeah, there's a saying. Michelle Gondry's got this thing where he likes to make people small. And I don't understand it, and it's something that he does artistically. He does it a lot in Science of Sleep. Mm -hmm. There's elements of it in Be Kind Rewind, as you may have you've imparted on me. I haven't seen that film. <laughs> no, you haven't. But way to pretend that you have. Well, for I was a going there. to pretend. And I like I how you cop to it. That was good. Yes. I need to be honest here. These are there is a childhood curiosity in that film. It's true. And I think that Michel Gondry just kind of has this thing where he likes to tie characters to their childhood. He likes mm -hmm. to bring adulthood and childhood into a kind of an eclipse. I love that stuff. I have a reason for that. His reason might be more stupid and French. Freudian and, and whatever. It's French. But it's I'm sure a reason. lot of people in interpreting and analyzing this film will give you a dumb Freudian reason. I think it's as simple as the childhood curiosity and creativity that a lot of people do lose as adults. Uh, it's why Robert Rodriguez's children write his films, mm -hmm. you know? It's I've heard him talk about that all the time about trying to you hear a lot of directors talk about that, how their kids at heart, really not even at heart, but just in their day to day lives, how they never grew up. And some of the most creative filmmakers view themselves as children. Uh, Michelle Gondry's films look like the films that a kid might have created uh, stuff that I'm sure he's been creating since he was a kid, especially the kind of effects he's using where it's all creative props and the maneuvering of. The stuff in this movie, like the different sets, the way they play with lighting during the scene, you know, usually you set up lights on a scene and you shoot the scene and that's that. But he'll shut off lights in the background. There's that great scene when Joel walks out of the bookstore and into the apartment, which I'm pretty sure if this isn't the way they're doing it, the way they could do it is the same way we saw in Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, where you just build the two sets and it just seems like something that wouldn't exist there. But that helps you tell the story without just using some kind of transitional gimmick. All of these are effects, the kind of things that as you grow into adulthood, maybe you start to tell yourself you can't do something mm -hmm. like that. And when you're a kid, because you don't know, you know the ceiling of possibilities, you don't tell yourself that's fucking impossible. You just say, well, he's in a shower and now he's on a boat and now he's on a horse. Another piece of the visual component of the film is using the single light in the dark rooms. It's almost like, uh, you know, it looks like a flashlight. It looks like what yeah. we see in a lot of these handy cam adventures. Yeah, well, it's... The REC type of one light on the camera in the... It's like a... It's a really interesting horror movie element yeah, that, yeah. that instead of making it scary, it just kind of makes it urgent and a little yes. dreamlike. As if this is sort of a nightmare for him, but this isn't a nightmare film. We see that with people's uh, faces, too. I like when he's trying to turn Patrick around and he has no fucking face or there is uh, there's one scene, I think, where they're kind of stumbling around Lacuna, the Lacuna building, where they turn to look at Patrick and his eyes are fucked up. They're upside down or something. It's really freaky. But the music and the tone isn't that of a nightmare. It's just telling you that Joel himself is kind of having a nightmare. Here. Right. The falling car, I know I've mentioned before, because that is one of the times that I almost feel like it's a scare shot. I've kind of become immune to those now because we see them all the time in right. movies we talk about. But when that car just falls from the sky for no reason, and it's scarier than it might be in a horror film because you don't expect something like that. Mm -hmm. And that's the beginning of when the entire world starts to crumble, when the labels just start to disappear from things. Um, you know, things disappear a lot in the movie themselves, whether they're wiped out, like when they're in the, the subway yeah. and that stuff is uh, kind of digital. Or the one I really like is when Joel's holding the Chinese food, the camera pans away, yeah. it pans back to him and he's not holding the food. Here's the incredibly complicated way they accomplish that. He just hands the food to someone else when the camera's, you know what I mean? Little tricks like that. Everybody knows if you stop to think for a second how it's done, but that's not where the beauty of it lies. Right. The beauty is in the simplicity. It's in the performance. Jim Carrey can look down as if he's still holding the chopsticks and the uh, the box and go, whoops, where did that go? And it's kind of a funny moment, just stuff disappearing like that throughout the film, but always in different ways, in different, unique, creative ways that never grind on you, never get old and tiring and feel like gimmicks. Gimmicks like, oh, I don't know, soft focus. 
I mean, that's what a lazy <laughs> filmmaker does, right? right? We could be talking about every time Joel goes into dream mode to help you, and that would be the excuse they use too, wouldn't it? Uh-huh. Oh, to help you differentiate yeah. the the dream world from the regular yeah. world so you can piece it together. Yeah. We've given you soft focus. But they give you hair color. That's Fucking all boring. Yeah, I would much rather have hair color to help you out there. But they fuck with the lights and stuff inside the dream world just in kind of fuzzing them out, but they don't soft focus and ruin the quality of the entire frame in order to do that. So choices like that really help make it a unique film and the whole fucking reason we're talking about it today. One other unique thing that the film did that we didn't really touch on was the viral advertising, which at the time, I mean, this was back when viral advertising was still something unique, still something creative that people... Now, every movie has some kind of viral website or viral something. But uh, when the movie came out, much like being John Malkovich... They advertised the the product, yeah, the company. You right. know, in being John Malkovich, it was the J and M Inc. and the technology that was behind that. Rather than advertising the movie, you see an ad for a Lacuna can wipe your memory of these people, you know, who you were with, of these horrible experiences you had, half price off Valentine's Day sale or New Year sale or whatever it was, and people would get interested in that and they would go to the website or uh, really often in the early viral stuff. They wouldn't even have websites. It would be a phone number you could call. I mean, you remember that from, what was that, The Lost Experience, yeah. right, that was doing that? There was uh, a lot of that with the Nine Inch Nails uh, ARG, uh, the Year Zero stuff, where you would call a phone number and it would tell you stuff. You could hack into uh, voicemails, and that would kind of get you attached to the film. It's just this really weird new kind of method of promoting that also got people, the, the right people, too, the people who would like to deconstruct a movie that doesn't feed it to them in a linear fashion. They want to figure out the clues and piece things together. The advertising would have them doing that before they even got to the film. Just really creative stuff. It's kind of sad that everyone's doing that now. It cheapens Mm -hmm. it a little bit, Um, but still really great at the time. All right, well, I'm indied out. So uh, we got this website that you can go to, doublefeatureshow.com. You could send us an email. Should they email us anything, or is this just a no homework week? If I get one fucking email about what, eagle versus shark, is that what oh that goddamn God. thing is? I swear to you, I will hunt you down and unsubscribe from your iTunes. Um, I don't know. As long as they're not emailing us about Napoleon Dynamite, I don't care what they email right, us about. great. Just send us some emails. Enjoy your weekend. Double feature show at gmail.com. Uh, we've got a Facebook. You can leave us a review on iTunes. As many stars or thumbs. Or, I don't know how iTunes works. As I think many, it's stars. If many, you can write us in a little. Not a Podmanity review. Jesus. The Podmanity <laughs> reviews will not stop. Um, Where's the Podmanity? <laughs> I don't know where it is. It's in our listenership, apparently. Uh, yeah, leave us a little review thing on iTunes. One other thing. If you didn't catch it back when we did Tremors in the Fog, the show on that, um, we do finally have a plan for the donations. Yeah. So we're going to take everybody who donates, enter them into a raffle, and then toward the end of the year, we're picking uh, two winners out of the raffle. Each will get to write up a list of movies, and we're going to pick one movie from each list, pair them together, and do a double feature at the end of the year. So for everybody who keeps writing us in and saying, hey, you need to check out this movie, I would really love to hear this movie on the show, send us a donation, and you could potentially be part of that disaster. So that's donate.doublefeatureshow.com. You can also go on there and do the subscription donation. And everybody who sends us one of those, we're going to record vocal clips toward the end of the year and do an entire intro, or maybe two, where we remove the vocal clips that are in there right now, the ones we recorded way, way back when we started the show, and put in the listener clips instead, which will be amazing, I'm sure. So that's donate.doublefeatureshow.com. Next week on the show, we're doing something uh, you and I have been waiting for for fucking ever. Yeah. Two movies, The Expendables and Machete both of which are currently in theaters. So we'll get to do some really hokey, we just went out to the movies kind of episode. It will also be awesome. Great. Watch more fucking film. All right. Bye.